right. So welcome to the Observe Wonder Think Green Chemistry Interactive Webinar. We are thrilled to have Annette Sabuyera, a certified lead teacher, presenting for you tonight. And yes, thank you for that reminder that if you are tuning in, it's really important for everybody to go ahead and mute so that there isn't feedback for the group. All right, fabulous, wonderful. So we would like to take a quick minute to say if what it is that you're enjoying um, in terms of Beyond Benign programming to go ahead and please follow us on social media. You can find us at Beyond Benign on all of the social media platforms. And if tonight there's part of the conversation that you'd like to share with others, then you can go ahead and use the hashtag um, observe wonder think to pass that message along. Go ahead. Um, I have just put into the chat our code of conduct and by registering for our webinar series, you have already agreed to abide by our code of, code of conduct, which essentially is all about being kind and open, um, respectful to participants. We're going to make this as interactive as we can. So we just ask that you please be mindful um, of all the other participants um, in the webinar together. Excellent. And I'd like to briefly just take this moment knowing that we are in the, this virtual space and all of us are tuning in from unceded land and we'll um, acknowledge the unceded land that Beyond Benign operates in, um, which is the Pawtucket and Massachusetts nations. But we know that, um, again, since everyone is tuning in from all over the place, it was wonderful to see from so many different places. We just wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that. And as more people are joining. So Beyond Benign, we're a nonprofit education organization that is, you know, basically looking to make this shift in science education. So we envision this world where the chemical building blocks um, that are used every day are healthy and safe for humans and the environment. And we're working to do this by building a community across the continuum from K-12 all the way to industry. And the way, the way that we do this is across that education community. Um, so starting at the K-12, which this is our audience tonight. And if you're in another audience, we welcome you. Um, but this particular webinar will be focused on K-12 educators. Um, it will be spotlighting our open access resources. So at that K-12 level, it's all about inspiring, all right? In the informal ed, it's demystifying. How can we make chemistry accessible to all? Um, and the undergrad, that's where you start to prepare and gain those tools. And it's really that implementation that happens at the industry level. So we work across the continuum to be able to integrate and weave in, you know, green chemistry principles and practices across that. Next. And why do we do this? Because there's this amazing opportunity. This is a really, really exciting field to get into. And we'd love for you to be able to take this back to your students and provide them with the knowledge that guess what? By pursuing a career in, in chemistry, in green chemistry, there are opportunities, opportunities not just in designing solutions in the lab, but also by innovating through business and making policy shifts so there's huge opportunities across the board, and that's really what this is all about. Thanks, Anat. All right, and it, without further ado, I now am going to turn it over to our speaker for the evening, Annette Sabuyera. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you all for joining us tonight for the first of our sessions, and we are so excited to have you with us. And this webinar overview, we're going to introduce you to the world of fabulous fabrics. And then we're also going to introduce you at the same time to the green principles of green chemistry and also show you the connectivity between fabrics to lab analysis and case studies. And we'll share some examples with you. And so we hoped that you could turn on your camera if this is your first time learning about green chemistry.
All right. And then the second choice would be, please turn on your camera if you're already implementing green chemistry practices in your school or in your classroom. Thank you all. So we're going to continue this as an interactive activity. So we're going to ask you to join the pair deck and the code is right on the top of my slides. So if you just go to pd.com, And the class is all lowercase t-w-j-u-f-i. Great. So green chemistry and fabulous fabrics. So starting on October 16th, all the way up to the 22nd, it is National Chemistry Week and it's a celebration. The topic being fabulous fibers. So the material and information we share with you today can be implemented in a variety of ways. At the high school level, which is going to be the main basis of tonight's presentation, you may be taught during the acids and bases unit as a pH indicator. It could also be taught during the bonding units when you're studying interactions based on intermolecular forces or even forensics evidence analysis as an extension. And our take with this would be that at the end of this, your students should be able to consider the difference between natural and synthetic fibers. They should be able to apply green chemistry concepts to decision-making. They should be able to investigate the ways that a variety of fabrics will interact with both basic and acidic dyes. And of course, investigate the impact of pH changes through dyeing a fabric. And so fibers become textiles, they become fabrics. But first, whether it's the gentle silk of a sari, the wool blend of a suit, or the tough denim of your Levi jeans, fabrics are incredibly diverse material. So for the first interaction, please check your label and type in what you are wearing. ¿Y cómo le iban a harvest el útero? Like, ¿para qué tú harvest el útero? Se lo hace como, like, punishment o algo. That's right. Pero no las quieren preñar o algo, mm -hmm. like. Lots and lots of cotton. So here's what we see. We have a whole lot of people wearing cotton. There's polyester blend, there's cotton, there's um, fleece and, and blue in color. There's uh, all types, but mostly I'm seeing cotton. I'm seeing cotton and polyester as the two predominant ones. So thanks guys. So whether Give me a second. So whether you are wearing cotton or polyester or fleece or silk, the list of fibers and fabrics is endless. No matter how many they are, maybe they can all be placed into just two categories, synthetic or natural. And what makes a fabric one or the other? And does it matter? Well, we kind of say that Synthetic is any textile that's man-made. It is manufactured by man. 
And the natural textile is anything that's either plant-based or from an animal source. So we go around with the generalization term of, you know, it is natural or it is synthetic. And that's how we'll talk about safety and in our fabric language. So please go ahead and add whether your item that you're wearing is synthetic or natural. Very good. Very good. Interesting. And what I'm seeing from the responses is that even though we had a lot of cotton in the one before, we seem to have way more synthetic than the ones that you saw. So these are the responses. So we got a whole lot of naturals in the beginning for all those who are wearing cotton. I also got natural and synthetic. I got both. So it's interesting that we were able to see all this. So thank you, everyone. Well, to continue with that. Annette, I'm going to just yeah. jump in. There was an interesting yeah. question of yeah. how, to classify, how to classify bamboo. And it imitates viscose. Viscose so, is natural. Yeah. 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 However, if something else has been added to it to make it into a smooth fabric blend, then we call that regenerated, which falls under synthetic. Very awesome. cool. Thank you. Yeah. And thanks for adding questions. I, I know that Annette, yeah. <laughs> Annette would love to see questions in the chat. And I don't think I said that at the very beginning. So I appreciate yes, people, yes, yes. whether you're in Pear Deck or whether you are putting, you know, in the, chat. in the chat, we love both. So thank you. Thank you. So now we can say, all right, so how did you do? Well, Depending on what you were wearing, if you had polyester, which was a lot of uh, responses, your response would have been synthetic. And then if you had cotton or wool, you would have been natural. And you can see that, you know, the synthetic um, is a really wide variety. In fact, for synthetic, the list could have gone on and on and on. And for the natural, it's a little bit more limited. And what would be interesting for me is to actually find out um, there is viscose, which is bamboo based, but there are others. And so, you know, like the cashmere and the silk. So those are the natural. So the variety is vast. So for both synthetic and natural, the generalizations about green chemistry, you know, it's all natural. It's chemistry with a pollution prevention mindset. And of course, knowing all about fabrics, there are some concerns. So here are some concerns. The textile industry is one of the major polluters. The left shows a schematic of textile manufacturing. You can see that it, it is energy intensive. It uses a lot of water. It requires many different solvents and it has some hazardous catalysts. On the right, you're seeing um, a copy of a picture that I found, which was a study that was done about seven years ago into what it takes, how much water is needed to make one t-shirt. And you can see that on the bottom is 2,700 liters of water for the production of one t-shirt, one single t-shirt, which is about the same amount of water you need for 2.5 years. So these are concerns. So these are things that you could discuss with your students, bring up with your students and see if there are ways in which you can deal with these. And of course the pros and cons, they're extensive for both. And there are a lot of opportunities to improve the process and the products in the fabric industry. And this is where green chemistry comes in. It comes in in the designing of safer materials from the start to ensure products that are safe for the environment. And just to kind of look at our list, the pros for natural, uh, I mean, on the left, I have the pros for synthetic, and you can see, hey, why do I want a synthetic fabric? Well, it's inexpensive, 
it's wrinkle free. Think about uh, sports uniforms. It's moisture wicking. That means you won't feel all wet. It's going to absorb the moisture away from your skin. And it's low maintenance. You just throw it in the washer, throw it in the dryer, and you're all set. But the cons, it's non-biodegradable. It's man-made, which means you're going to need the water, the energy. And it's prone to heat damage. And it uses harsh chemicals. So that's one side of it. On the natural side, the pros are it's hypoallergenic, it's breathable, it's biodegradable, it's light shielding. But even though it's breathable, do you want your baseball uniform to be made of cotton? Well, if yes, you're going to deal with it's expensive. You're going to deal with it's prone to shrinking. You're going to deal with it holds moisture and it's delicate. Think about how much it costs to clean your silk shirt. You have to go to the cleaners. So all these are considerations that we have to look at. So a better understanding of the complexity of fabrics production is when we take the students in this activity, we use them to get a better deep insight into what it is that goes into fabrics. So the students are required to match the cards by pairing them off. And then they're encouraged to have a discussion and each method has its concerns. So if we were to number these slides, if we were to number these slides from left to right, they would go, uh, these pictures, by excuse me, one through six. So what do you think in the prompt Write down the order in which you think this would be put together. So just put your numbers, which is going to be one, which is going to be two, which is going to be three, four, five, and six. Feel free to also just write numbers like three, four, two, one. <laughs> Interesting. And that Scott um, put in here, mm -hmm. if folks were possibly already interested or have an understanding about what ginning is. Ah, so ginning is the refining of cotton to put it into a thread-like mode. So usually you pick up a little cotton blob in there and then it has to be, it's almost equivalent to the spinning of wool. Thank you. Ah. Interesting. Okay, y'all. Yeah. yeah. So some people actually, yeah, they they saw it already what we did. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So here's what it looks like. Uh, we had a lot of people, a few people saw that it was actually in the proper order. It was just one, two, three, four, five, six. And then some thought that, you know, you had to exchange it, but you're going to start with a crop. You know, you're going to start with a crop. You're going to pick your cotton. You're going to get it ginned into threads or into strands. And then you're going to um, make your fabric with a group of fibers. Beautifully done, guys. Okay, very cool. What if you had a different type of fabric? What if it was this type? This.
Can you your new prompt? Again, one, two, three, four, five. Nicely done. Good job, Scott. Nice, beautiful. Excellent job, everyone. Beautifully done, nice. Okay. And of course you can see that we got our responses spot on at this time, everyone does. So how do you implement this into a classroom? So what we do with this, so in class, so this is an activity that the students use to get a better understanding of the complexity of fabrics production. Uh, so the students are required to arrange the cards in the order in which they're supposed to be product produced from all the way from the growth all the way to the production to the end of the product itself. But they don't just get the ones for a synthetic or the ones for the natural, they get them as all the cards together and then they have to arrange them. So I want to share with you so you can see what they normally get. So what they would get is this. And then they have to pick them off and figure out which ones go towards the natural process of the natural fabric, and then which one goes towards the synthetic process. But you can see that ideally, both of them end up in the landfill. So then knowing that, um, we can say, all right, so as we think about most of these and we know that they're expensive and we know that there's some that cannot be um, recycled, when we do the activity with the diability, we're thinking about this one. We're thinking about two main things. What is the fabric type and what is the type of dye? Those are the two considerations that we're going to be working with. So in this activity, we say, is the dye acidic or basic? Is the fabric natural or synthetic? And when would it retain the color that we want to dye it best? When would it be the best production? So that's where the pH scale comes in. Remember in the beginning, I alluded to the fact that you can do this during the acid base unit. So you would require your students to have some understanding of the pH scale. They would need to know what it means to be an acid, meaning a pH below seven, and what it means to be a base, a pH above seven. They would also need to know what we did, what we practiced at the beginning of this activity is that what it means to be a synthetic fabric and what it means to be a natural fabric. So you can see that I sort of indicate that, okay, so knowing the fabric types, positive and negative interactions, this is how properties determine the diability of fabrics. So you are going to say, all right, so if I am an acidic dye, what is it that I can attract and stick to? If I'm a basic dye, what is it that I can attract and stick to. So in the activity, we say to the students that first of all, you want to check the pH of your dye. Is the pH above seven or below seven? And then we say, is your fabric natural or synthetic? And then what we decide is that we lead them through with these interactions. I'm gonna to go to the next slide just to sort of take you through what is needed. Here's a summary chart that the students begin with. So we know that when we are dealing with a 
synthetic fabric, we're gonna say what type of a charge it has and what it's going to attract. So normally we have studied and we know that when you take an acid dye and you dissolve it in water, it tends to end up attract a negative charge. And that's the excessive part of it. And then the basic dye ends up attracting the positive one. So now you have a positive and a negative. So what we have the students do is that we give them a fabric ribbon and you can see the black line on top and that tells you how to read your filament. And every time you get the piece of that ribbon, you read it from the top where the black line is. The students go through and they label it as synthetic or natural. And then synthetic dyes tend to have a negative charge. Natural animal-based, I'm sorry, my apologies. Synthetic fabrics tend to have a negative charge and natural animal-based tend to have a positive charge. So synthetic like basic and natural like acidic. There are some plant-based fabrics that would only do well with that dyes. So with that background and with their prediction chart, which is this, we can give them the materials that they need. So you can see here that there's cooling, but many food products can be used to dye cloth. Kool-Aid is used in this experiment, not only because it is used as a standard stain in a range of products from industry to fabric cleaning products, but also because it is safe for the students. And so the fabric dyeing is going to be done using Kool-Aid. You could use coffee, Coca-Cola. Um, most of the colored drinks are going to make good dyes. And so the fabric ribbon, we get it from Educational Innovation and that will be in our resources that we share with you at the end of the experiment. The litmus paper is to test for acidity or basicity. The water is to make the dye and the ammonia is to turn a dye that's already acidic into a basic so that you have both. You can use ammonia or you can use baking soda in order to make your dye basic by adding an excess of ammonia. The vinegar is used to make a dye that comes to you as basic and you want it to be a little bit acidic. So you add that vinegar, both household products. So what the students end up doing, and the equipment is very simple. You need forceps, plastic cups, measuring spoons, and paper towels. So what the students end up doing is that they're just going to take the Kool-Aid, take a scoop of the Kool-Aid, and then add that to the water, make their solutions. And then they will end up with a, a dye that is a beautiful color. They're going to take the fabric swatch and they're going to place it in the dye for about five minutes, remove it with forceps, rinse it in water, and then you can see the finished product at the bottom. We then encourage the students to tape this onto their worksheets. So that's their data table. And the way you, the way you evaluate this is that you can say strongly attached, moderate, weak, or not at all. And so that's what they're comparing. So they're comparing the intensity in which the dye stuck to the fabric. So here's an actual example. So you give the students a little piece of paper that has a multi-fiber ribbon. You can see that I accidentally wrote synthetic next to the viscous because I was going with the spun. But Kool-Aid comes to us as acidic. And you can see that in the second swatch, we added ammonia and you see the intensity switches around. You can use Coca-Cola, you can use coffee, you can use citrus lavender tea. On the far right, you can see that we used blueberries and we were able to add, um, the blueberries were acidic when we checked with the, uh, with the pH paper. 
and we added some ammonia and we got the basic one and you see that the intensity switches, which then you can have students have some discussions after this from their lab. Discussions could be, how did pH affect the diability of each fabric? What happens or what type of patterns did you notice? In other words, what happened when you put one fabric in the acidic dye and what happened to the same fabric in the basic dye? Which fabrics died best in acidic dye? Which ones died best in basic dye? So that the students can make up a pattern which can then lead them to their claim, evidence and reasoning. Back to, now I wanna take you back to Green Camp. The criteria, the three criteria, low cost, emphasis on safety, high performance. And so we want to be able to have students carry this a little bit farther up. So if you were able to have the students do this life cycle activity earlier on, we can say, now that you know about the properties of the fabrics and the productions of these textiles and the impact on the environment, we can then pose the question, which one of these would a green chemist choose? Which fabric would a green chemistry be most likely to choose as one to work with? So you're considering the types of material, the diability of the fabrics, which one do you believe a green chemist would want to use? So that is my prompt. I just want to hear your thoughts. Um, so here we go. Synthetic or natural? And maybe two supporting words, why? Thank you, Wendy, that's good, that's good. Interesting, interesting. We're getting terms such as upcycling. Very cool, very cool. Biochemical pathways, interesting. Oh, I love all this. Interesting, Annette, yeah. Annette, okay. I know you're getting to see all of the answers and I know you're I'm gonna I'm, a, I'm, I'm, a, I'm um, about to share them, yeah. Do you get anything yeah. in the chat? Um, nope, I was also just thinking in terms of timing, we can kind of gauge if we, we've got time if we want to break out into small little groups to have quick little conversations if you think that might oh, be helpful I totally think up to that you. would be great yeah I'm gonna let you do the breakout rooms okay <laughs> give me one second uh I think we can just do two of them one for natural one for synthetic because that's exactly what everyone's um it's interesting but somebody said it depends on the intention so that's cool Go for it. Breakout room number one could be for natural. Breakout Excellent. room number two can be for synthetic. All right, that works. We're gonna have like five minute conversation. Yeah, I love it. To debate it. Okay. Great, so, oh. <laughs> Have you guys been picking? I'm gonna open the rooms now.
I'm going to ask Greg to go to room two. Please. Excellent. I'm going to set a timer for about three minutes. Kate, which one do you want to go to? Um, I'm going to, I have to stay here to monitor and send people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so right now, two has um, a few less people oh. than room one. Room one has Very got funny. Aaron, Scott and Aaron and Stephanie all in it. So you could go to room two with Greg. I mean, it's a, okay. it's a smaller room or you can just stay here with me too. It's, okay. Okay. So I'm going to broadcast a message to everybody. And say, I think Anne has to join and Simone and Michelle. They have to join. All right, I just gave a two minute warning and then we'll pull people back. Does that sound good for you? Is that good pacing for you? <laughs> You're muted now, Annette, but that's okay. <laughs> I said, I was talking to my grillers here. <laughs> ah, yeah. My responses um, in the screen, do you see them when I share? Like, do you see it on your screen? Um, right now it's locked. Right now you're showing the locked. Oh, I see it now. Sorry, yeah. yes. Sorry, I was, yes. It's kind of cool. Yeah, no, it's great. All right, I'm gonna give. Oh, I'm gonna do the close the rooms. Gives everybody 30 seconds to get back. <laughs> How are they gonna share? I guess we'll ask if there's somebody who wants to share since we didn't give them. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody's coming on back. Yeah, welcome back. And if anybody switched their shirts, because synthetic is better. <laughs> <laughs> and I went from two minute warning to 30 seconds. The room is closing. So okay. <laughs> sorry, I missed my one minute warning to you all. I'm, maybe there is. 
Maybe some of you were mid sentence. <laughs> Go ahead, Annette. I'm going to mute. All right. So, guys, who would like to share what came out of that meeting? Somebody can unmute and tell us. Not many talkers. Room one, was that natural? It was, we had a lively discussion. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to find my compatriots who were in, sharing so much insight in the chat. It was I, during the, yeah, right. Uh, I think that was Melba who had some great ideas. I'm trying, I can't see anyone's face anymore. So now I can't tell who was who. <laughs> Stephanie, Aaron, you want to shout out some high flyers from our conversation? Um, sure. So I think, well, the th I think the things that came up were really thinking about life cycle and energy use, and then really thinking about, um, uh, the point at the end, and I don't remember who said it, so I apologize, but it's a great point about thinking about climate impact as well. So it's, it's not just about, you know, the total life cycle and being able to reuse things, but it's also about, you know, there's, you know, if you're talking to animal products, um, if you think about sheep, that is very resource intensive to, to raise those sheep and to get them to the place where we can get, um, materials from them. And at the same time, there's a lot of climate impact from decisions like that. So it's really, I think, being very intentional about or thinking um, about the entire life cycle of the product from start to end of life. But there were some great ideas in the group. Mm -hmm. I think I would remember hearing from Maureen, I think it was Maureen, talking about um, the idea of which one felt better in a football player for damages and how would you, what would that life cycle be? I think it was, if Maureen, if you want to jump in and reflect on that a little. I know Anne was talking about the um, atom economy, green principle, principle talking about how, whether or not the materials used in it would make anything that we even start out being natural end up being non-green by the end of its, the conversation about its production. So let me take all the thunder ladies, please jump in and jump and Sari, what yeah. you thought. Yeah, yeah, is Anne there? No, Anne. Greg had the other room, what came out of that? We discussed many of the same things that you just talked about, but we also um, sort of went off in a direction of talking about the practicality and the purpose and the intent of the product and how well, you know, that one may take a dye better and show a stronger color than another type. And then we also talked a little bit about um, whether or not it would hold on to that color or is there going to be sort of a transferability? Do you want to wear something where maybe the, the dye is going to rub off on your skin or something like that? Oh. So we went more sort of a, you know, kind of looked at the practicality and, and the purpose and the intent of the product as well. I love it. And, and Kate, can you see the chat? I can only see half the screen, but uh, there was some interesting, um, I think as Ada said in the chat, Thanks for that. I have heard very little about the life cycle analysis for the last decade, but it used to be a big part of looking at environmental ethics of products. So really interesting. So yeah, you know, and, and our aim is, you know, get these young minds thinking about it and not just say cotton is better and that's the end of the day. And I was gonna thank you so much guys for your feedback. I wanted to share a little bit of some of the responses that you began to type. So you know, you can see if they say it's synthetic, you know, um, the potential downside of microplastics. I mean, that's really, really some deep reasoning in there. Uh, somebody saying natural because you can use natural dyes, uh, natural because it comes from natural resources. But then again, from your discussions, you know, you talked about the production. So we are not just picking a cotton ball and wearing it. There's some limited, you know, production that goes in between. So yeah, so we were hoping tonight that we would arm you guys with some ideas to have these various discussions with your students and not just say, you know, an acid is this a basis that, but you just go a little bit deeper and, you know, reflect on what goes into the fabrics. Um, 
production. So thank you so much. Kate, I don't know if you wanted to add something else. Um, I know that you've put the link in the link, the link to the middle school activity. Uh, Yes, I did put the link to the middle school activity and I'll, I'll start, I'll put more of the links too um, for other resources if you want to go ahead and that too. And we'll, yeah, yeah. it complements exactly no. what we're talking about here. Yeah. All right. So now we ask, you know, we ask the kids with that, we also give them the 12 principles of green chemistry. And so it's another way to bring this back full circle to the students. If they can come up with a way to explain why they think one is better, you can bring them back to the 12 principles and say, well, which one of these, you know, can we apply to our reasoning in why we are going one way or the other? So, you know, and you remind the students that when considering fabrics from green camp perspective, you let them know that it's difficult to determine whether one fabric is greener than the other because of the many components that must be considered in the production of fabrics as your discussion groups came up with. Synthetic, you know, it's completely man-made. Some, some are recyclable. Somebody talked about upcycling. Natural may also be um, plant-based. And, you know, there's the ginning that goes into there. However, it's plant-based. It involves a lot of water usage. Pesticides may need to be used. So that's a consideration. Or is it animal-based? There's the shearing of the animal. There's the waste from the animal. There's the tanning process. So the list goes on and on, but it's just a really nice way to begin a discussion in your classroom as a link to what else that you are teaching your students. And what a wonderful way to bring it full circle to the 12 principles of green chemistry. So the application of dye process is also very complicated, but this is, um, this too can be a direction of the study. I kind of took you through just natural synthetic, but you could go through the dyes also that will lead to a direction of greener, more sustainable materials. So as we said, we'll give you examples. So there's a still case um, example where they use safer fabrics. So here, the industry example, the cogent group. Um, over here, what this cogent group decided, uh, so there's a lesson that was put together by some beyond benign teachers and was focused around the still cases cogent group of textiles and which are unique. Uh, they are polyester fabrics that are made instead of using the hazardous heavy metal antimony catalyst, they use titanium, um, which is the standard process for making polyester. The materials are also designed to be used, recovered, and remanufactured safely and effectively through multiple product life cycles. And the lesson focuses around the natural dyes and safer dye chemistry. So that's a whole other way, but this is an industry. This is on the Beyond Benign website. You can download the entire lesson and use it with your students. So Kate, did you wanna add anything to that one there? I just put the high school link in there now um, for, for folks and you can, yeah, because this is a steel case um, example, there are, you, there's actually, I just saw a video. I think I'm going to we'll put it in there in the chat too. I will say I can't quite endorse it because I hadn't seen it before, but I think um, the there's just Steelcase is one of those companies who's really, you know, walking the walk when it comes to sustainability and they've been doing it for a long time. So it's really neat when, um, because they help partner with us. So. Yeah. 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 Good Stop stuff. There. Good stuff. Yep. All right. And of course we don't want to leave you hanging without additional resources. Uh, National Chemistry Week, if you can attend an event, it's fabulous fibers. You should be able to get a lot for your classes there. I particularly used to tell the kids extra credit if they can attend one where they are and bring back something to share with the class as a lesson. The Chemet Exchange also has resources. 
science buddies, and don't forget Beyond Benign, Green Chemistry Education, K-12, anything you need over there, you can download it. It's in PDF, it's in Word, and so that you can tweak it to how you want. So I know we've loaded you with a ton of material and we maybe did not give you enough time to ask questions. So do you have any questions? I'm watching the chat. Okay. All right. There's a lot more events taking place. We want to tell you about two of them um, in November. There's the Green Chemistry Connections, which will have, take place on November 16th from 12 to 2. And the second of the Observe Wonder Think events is going to be on November 17th. So if you've enjoyed this one, be sure to register for the one next because excellent, excellent. Um, you get to see one of my colleagues, lead teachers. And of course, we would be amiss if we did not thank our sponsors who make it possible for all our workshops to take place, these fantastic webinars, and for you guys to log on and we get to enjoy your company. Um, so, you know, there's a variety of them. So if you see um, any of these logos somewhere, you know, dig deeper into it because they are behind green chemistry and encourages them on through the Beyond Benign sponsorship. And Kate, not sure if you want to say something else. Yay. And we just want to say a great big thank you to you guys for taking your time and joining us tonight. And we'll hope to see you in November. Right. And I just wanted to make sure to put a shot in here with Annette's direct email. Um, you can always reach out to Beyond Benign at info at beyondbenign.org. Um, and, and that we can get you in connection with any of our lead teachers who've been on the call with us tonight. Um, Greg Sloan, Aaron Mayer, we've got Scott Carlson, we've got Stephanie Loomis. Who am I missing? Am I missing somebody? I think our other two lead teachers. <laughs> and big um, shout out to Kate Anderson, who's our program director, who puts all these together and enables us to connect with you. So big, big thank you. All right. Thanks, everybody. Look at that. Three minutes. Are you yeah. sure there's no questions? We'll stick on and we'll be happy here to answer. for the next three minutes. Yeah. We can even stick on a couple extra. But if there's anybody, yeah. um, so long as you've registered, you will by tomorrow tomorrow. Um, if you did register, um, then we will be able to print out certificate. Well, register, get you, get you your professional development certificates <laughs> for your participation in the webinar today, um, tonight. So you'll see that in your emails tomorrow. And there had been a good question in the chat because yes, we've recorded this resource. Um, when we do send out that follow-up email, there will be a link with the slides and with all the resources that we've feverishly been putting into the chat as well so that it won't get lost on you. Um, and you'll have that in your email so you'll know where to go to find um, all of the, the great things that we were discussing tonight. So yeah, we're excited um, for this to kick off our entire academic year long series. And we do hope that you are able to join us at some more of the events. next. Next month's event is going to be geared specifically, um, again, all are welcome, but it's going to be a highlight of our latest and greatest elementary school curriculum where we partnered with Impossible Foods. So we'd love for you to, to, to join us for that. We'll be having a guest speaker from Impossible Foods, Dr. Laura Kleiman, join two of our lead teachers, um, one certified, Bob Baldo and Veronica Morato Weeks. So it should be a good time next next time as well. All right. Yeah. Have a great night, everybody. Thank Good you. Night. Now stop recording. <laughs>